anybody care to ask that? I think I've made enough mistakes in my life not to get red and get bothered and warm in the face about that, so. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the most precious thing that has been given to me. And in that knowledge and in that understanding of what, how God loved me, that he sent the son here, I have every answer that I will ever need. And every need that I have will be met. Because I understand the death, burial, and resurrection, I'm one of the richest people in this world. I'm a brother to a king. I'm a son to a mighty God. And no matter what comes my way, Joy, difficulty, anxiety, being overwhelmed, sadness, and even death, I have all the answers. You who are here that have gone to a baptism and arise, the child of God, all have that same knowledge. And for those of you who have not been baptized, that is our goal each and every Sunday, is to help you to come and understand all that you can have and all that God has promised you if you understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you can understand how much it is that God loves each and every one of us, those are the answers that you have each and every day. And I'll ask you this. Have you struggled this week? Has there been pain? Has there been grief? Is there sadness? Is there a lack of, whether it be confidence or faith or money, whatever it may be? And if so, why do we put ourselves through that? Because God talks to us in, his, in the word that even the birds are taken care of, the flowers are taken care of, all these things in earth and nature are taken care of, and yet they put no work in. And God, because of his relationship with man, cares about us even that much more so that he will take care of our every need. In Genesis chapter 1, we read about the story of Adam and Eve, and we read about God's creation, God creating the earth. And here in Genesis chapter 1, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the gospel in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. The gospel as it relates to Adam and Eve. But I think Adam and Eve and the way God interacted with them give us a very, very important insight, give us very important information that sometimes we lose track of. And when we go out and we preach God's word or when we're in discussions with other people about God's word, those people who don't know him and those people that do know him, oftentimes we get into the differences of what you understand, what I understand, what you know, what I know, what is truth and what is not truth. But I think God lays the groundwork to let us know what it is that we should be focused on. And he demonstrates that in the way that he lives with Adam and Eve. And the way that he interacts and he provides with them for them day in and day out. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we read this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. See, everything else that God made, he spoke, and it was created. And we read later on in the scriptures that God, when he got ready to make man, that he formed man. He just didn't speak man. He formed man. 
He took the time to go a little bit further, and he did something with mankind that he didn't do for anybody else, for any animals that he created or anything else he created, in that he breathed in the breath of life. The relationship that God desired to have with mankind was so important that he took the time to form him and then to breathe the breath of life into him. And so we're out teaching the gospel, and if we're out talking to people who may or may not know God, wouldn't you think that we start there? Wouldn't you think that maybe when we're talking to people about the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, that we want to let people know that the reason God sent Jesus Christ here is because he loves each and every one of us, whether they've come to know him or yet or not, right? Because God desires that everybody would come to know him, to be obedient to him, to share in the promises that he's given to us. That is desire for each and every one of us. And so that relationship with mankind, each and every man and woman here on this earth, is what God desired. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, And God saw that all he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. It wasn't until God created mankind that he said it was very good. Throughout Genesis, you see that he spoke and it was created and said it was good. He spoke, it was created, said it was good. He spoke, said it was created, it was good. But when he created man, he said it's very good. And as I look out into this world and the places that I've had a chance to travel, and I see these beautiful mountains, right? And I look at them in awe. And I think, that's very beautiful, right? But God said that was good. But what he said about you and I is, you're very good. So think about that. The majesty of a mountain, how beautiful it is when you see it with the snow capture, maybe the trees on the side of the mountain, right? You see that. And you sit there in awe. But understand that God feels that way about each and every one of us. Even at our lowest points in our lives, he's still looking for that for each and every one of us. You ever just stop and think about how it is that even when you're laying there still, you hear yourself breathe? What's triggering all of that? What makes your lungs go in and out and the rest of the body flex? And what's taking that oxygen throughout the body and giving that blood life? We are a wonderful creation that God took the time to make because he desired to have a relationship with each and every one of us. And so I challenge you as you go out and you speak of God's word, as you go out and you share the gospel with other people, that we focus on how important God wants to have a relationship for those people that have not yet come to know him. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it said, This is good and acceptable in the, in the sight of God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to know the knowledge of truth. Wants all people to be saved. We had a little get-together there at the house yesterday, and I thought I knew people pretty well, right? But as I sat and listened to the men that were around me, and I talked to the men around me, we, we, we realized, I think, pretty quickly that each and every one of us come from a different facet of life. We have different experiences. We have different last names, different colored eyes, different colored hair. Our experience, our intelligence level, our education level, our work level, our work experience, our families, everything about us was different, but yet we were a group there focusing on fellowship and relationship because of what God teaches us in Genesis chapter 1, how important that is. I was walking on clouds yesterday, I'll tell you that. I, I was blessed by the contact that I had with so many men, their fellowshipping yesterday. And that's what God desires to have with each and every one of us. Not only us, but those who don't yet know him. And with that comes so much more, and then we have the answer to all things in this world. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, 
I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. How do we expect people to understand the gospel? We can't help them to understand the relationship that God desires to have with them. If we give them the knowledge, if we give them the knowledge about Jesus Christ, if we give them the knowledge about the love that God has for us, he says, I will knock. I will knock at their door. I heard Moose talking yesterday about times that he's felt that God has talked to him, that he wonders why. Why, God, haven't you helped me? But yet he understood that God was there the whole time. As I started visiting here in October of 2005, I was studying with Brother Camacho and Brother Roach. And as we were studying more and more, I told Camacho, I said, look, I feel as if God is hearing my prayers. Right? But yet I wasn't a Christian. I hadn't been baptized. Camacho took me to some scripture in Isaiah, and I realized that I needed to be baptized because my sins would push God away from me. That my sins might shut down his ears from hearing my needs and my requests. And I'm thankful that that pointed it out to me because then I heard him. Then I heard him knocking. And thankfully, just thankfully, that door was open that he was patient for me. James chapter 4 and verse 8. He says, Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know, and this is the one thing that I continuously focus on in my life. When I find myself struggling, whether it be with sin or stress or anxiety, fear, uh, sometimes just not having the, the, the answers as a parent or as a husband, Maybe even as a son, right? As my parents get elderly and I don't have those answers and that fear creeps in. Oftentimes what I'll recognize is that I'm trying to lean on my own. Trying to lean on my own knowledge, my own understanding, my own ability to fix the problem as opposed to leaning on that relationship that provides me each and every answer, which is God. And that relationship is opened up through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Andy sent out a text this morning that talked about him, you know, driving a vehicle down here. He anticipated putting on a trailer and, and pulling it down here so he didn't have to worry about it breaking down. But the trailer was too small. And so now he had to engage in a seven or eight hour trip back down to the valley with the vehicle that he bought. And he said, I began to worry and stress about whether or not that vehicle was going to make it. And I know Andy. Andy probably had a pretty good sized toolbox. It probably weighed about 50 pounds. Probably had some antifreeze and everything else that he needed to go with him to anticipate that that was going to happen. Right? But Andy mentioned in that that he thought about some stories that he read in the Bible. He thought in particular about David and how David, when he struggled, he leaned on the relationship that he had with God. He leaned on the promises that God had given him and he stopped and he prayed. And Andy made it back in time. No broken vehicle. And he's here for services this morning. And what's the beauty of that? I don't know if you were in the four when they came in. I lost count at about number eight. But I think Andy must have brought in about 12 kids today with him on the bus and a few adults. What a beautiful thing, right? Because we take that for granted sometimes. If there are people in a household that are not teaching their children about God and the relationship that he desires to have for them, Thank God that we have somebody like Andy who's going to do everything that he can continuously for the last 15, 20, 30 years to help people come to know God and the relationship that God desires to have with these young children. And you can take a look at Alex, right? What a young man. Take a look at Alex and how he learned about God and how this congregation helped him to build his knowledge in God and how this congregation helped him to come to know God and now the fine young man that he is because somebody took the time to say, let me teach him. There are many who ride with Andy in that bus on a regular basis that you don't know about because having 12 young kids in that bus popping around, uh, that, that's pretty exciting to say the least. So thank you all for what you all do. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 and through 17 says, 
The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and tend to it. The Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on the day that you eat of it you will certainly die. Now, although God has a desire to have the relationship with mankind, from the get-go, God has set aside a particular law and or rule that he wishes for man to follow. And I'll tell you why that is here in just a moment. But he created, formed man, breathed the breath of life into mankind, created this beautiful garden for them, making sure that he was taking care of them, in which this garden he showed up regularly. His presence walked amongst them. And he put them into that garden, and he said, everything is taken care of, tend to it. But there wasn't really that much work going into that garden at that time. But he made them head over all the beasts and everything that walked on the earth as well, right? Are you seeing how important mankind is to God? But he does tell them this, of that one tree of knowledge, of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will certainly die. And here's the reason why. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 reads this way. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And in Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, we get the same thing in the New Testament. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And so God says that as a human, I've taken great care to form you. I breathe the breath of life to you. I put you in this beautiful garden to take and tend to and have this relationship with you. I walk amongst you. And all you have to do is not eat from that one tree. And as long as you don't eat from that one tree, you have everlasting life. I will walk among you and there will be no death. There will be no reason that mankind has to die a physical death. But he says, I must be first in your life. I must be the most important thing that you think of in your life. Parents, how difficult is that when you have children and grandchildren? How difficult is that when you want that nice home and that's been your dream? How difficult is that when you want that vehicle that works and doesn't break down on you all the time? Because if we don't stay focused, we become selfish. And when we become selfish, we take the place of God. We put ourselves and our interests and where we stand in life higher than God, focused on our individual things. And that leads to sin. Not only does it lead to sin, it creates distance between us and God, and that relationship gets further and further away from him. And as we get further and further away from him in that relationship, difficulties in our life can begin to be multiplied. That's not to say that as you stand close to him and have him in the forefront, that you're not going to have those problems but what I've learned is I'm focused on God and putting him first in all things. Those problems are much easier to manage. And when I don't know how to manage through them, it's easy just to say, God, you're in charge. And I know you'll get me through this. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he tells Adam and Eve this in the same way. He says, I'm going to give you all of this, and the only thing that I ask you is, don't eat of that tree. And here's what's interesting about that, right? Because we don't think about this. It, it could sound like God was being selfish about telling us don't eat from that tree, but he was looking out for us. He was protecting us from ourselves when he said don't eat from that tree. Because when that knowledge kicked in, it changed everything. Sin, separation from God, 
caused by things that put anything ahead of God, and ultimately what it relates to is selfishness. When I become more important than God, my selfishness has shown itself, I'm on a path to sin. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Start to explore a little bit the relationship between Adam and Eve and God. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God really said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And the woman said to the, uh, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, but that your eyes will be open. I'm sorry, let me go back and read verse 5. It said, for God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6. For the woman saw the tree was good for, for food, lust of the flesh, and that it was a light to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And the tree was desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. She took some of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her. And he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they, they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves waist coverings. If there's anything that I can share with you this morning, I want you to be aware of it. Satan attacked Adam and Eve one particular way. Three things that fall in that way. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Fast forward to Matthew chapter 4, beginning in about verse 3 and going through on through about 6. When Jesus is up on the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights, Satan comes and he tempts him. Satan attacks him this way. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes and the pride of life. How do you think Satan is going to be attacking you in your day to day life? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He's not going to change the way that he comes at us. I talked about self awareness the other day a little bit when we were talking about communication in the class that we had two Sundays ago. If we can take the time to recognize in our lives when our relationship with God is not where it needs to be, and we can start to recognize when the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life is kicking in, don't you think we'd do a much better job of reversing, doing an about face, repenting of where we are, and leaning on God again, and trusting in that relationship that no matter what happens, he's going to take care of us. Not letting our selfishness take over to allow us to be tempted. Because Satan took what God said and he twisted it just a little bit. And when he did that, he got the attention of Eve. And then when he explained to her, you're going to be just as knowledgeable as God is, something clicked in her head. And pride kicked in. 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. You think we might get to understand what that means, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. We might get to understand what that means more because if it separates us from God, what happens? He told Adam and Eve, if you eat of that tree in the middle of the garden, you're going to separate yourself. Once you eat from it, death is coming. When Satan ensnares us and he tempts us the same way that he's tempted everybody for thousands of years and we can't recognize it, that separation from God is coming. It says what? The flesh of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life comes from this world, not from God. We go on in Genesis chapter 3, verse 11 and 13. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave uh, to be with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Here's what's interesting, right? 
Adam and Eve seem to be getting along pretty good in the garden at this point. As far as we know, there's no issues between them. They walk hand in hand, focused on God daily, and their relationship is great to the extent that they're even fully naked and there's no embarrassment. They have no idea that they are fully naked because that knowledge hasn't kicked in yet, right? But the minute that knowledge kicked in, all of a sudden, there's an issue within the relationship. She hands it to Adam. Adam takes a bite of the fruit. And then when God calls him out and says, what is this that you have done? The first thing that he does is he blames not her first, but he blames God first. The woman that you gave me. And then he blames her. She tempted me. She gave it to me. It's not my fault, God. You gave her to me, and then she tempted me. All of a sudden, that selfishness has really kicked in. And not only has he hurt the relationship between him and God, blaming God for his sin, putting himself first, but then he also turned and blamed the woman for his sin. Sin can destroy our relationships, and God has set the example to show us that relationships are key in his kingdom. Verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the livestock, and more than any animal of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will make enemies of you and the woman and of your offspring and her descendant. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. I underline him as it's capitalized and put in parentheses there, Jesus. And this is the first prophecy we have. If you've gotten to this point, you're thinking, how is he talking about the gospel when the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection? And we don't see the death, burial, and resurrection in the Old Testament in Genesis. Here it is. He shall bruise you on the head. That is Satan. When Jesus goes to the cross and he dies, that is the bruise. I'm sorry, I'm reversing that. He shall bruise you on the heel. That is when Satan. Go, I mean, Jesus goes to the cross and he dies. It says, but you shall bruise his head. If you take a shot in the heel, good chance you're going to survive from that, right? But if you take a head shot, you're probably not going to survive from that. And so here is the first prophecy that we are aware of, that Jesus Christ is going to die, bruise the heel, and then he's going to resurrect because he's going to come back and bruise his head. And so here we have the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And because there was disobedience, because there was selfishness, because there was a, a separation intentionally by mankind to separate themselves from God by disobeying him and eating of the tree, but also by putting themselves above God, then death comes in. And that's something you and I, each and every one, will face at some point. But we know that Jesus Christ saves us from that death in our spiritual lives. Verse 21. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his, and his wife and clothed them. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 reads this. For the life of flesh is in the blood, and I have given to you an altar to make atonement for your souls... For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. So in order for us as mankind to be right with God, to someday be in heaven with them, there must be blood that is shed, for the life is in the blood. And so in the Old Testament, he gave them animal sacrifices until Christ came. And then Christ was sacrificed for each and every one of us. There was that separation of relationship that we would have to die a physical death. But when Christ dies, the life is in the blood. And it's his blood that was shed for each one of us. 
that we shall be able to mend that relationship with God and stay right in that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 50. So it is also written, the first man, Adam, became a living person. The last Adam was a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. Verse 47. The first man is from the earth, earthy, and the second man is from heaven. As is the earthy one, so also are those who are earthy. And is the heavenly one, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we are born to the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. So although we're born into this earth first, an earthy man, we understand earthy things through Jesus Christ in baptism, dying to ourselves in this physical nature and being arisen in a spiritual form focused on God, we carry the image of the second Adam, making reference to Jesus Christ. And the New Testament puts it all together. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We have the responsibility of sharing the gospel throughout this world. We have the responsibility of sharing the gospel with each and every person that we possibly can. And sometimes we get so caught up in theology and teaching that we forget about the relationship that God desired to have with mankind. When Adam and Eve lived completely focused on what God asked them to do and focused on God's will, they walked perfectly with no sin, with God, with no threat of death. And no separation of that relationship. You and I, if we remain in God, if we desire that relationship daily, and we put him first in all things, then we have everything we will ever need to get through this life. And then, and then, we are promised all kinds of promises in heaven someday. And even promises here on earth as we walk through it. Salvation, we hear the God, word of God. We confess that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of our sins. Be baptized, immersed in the watery grave. Arise faithful and live in a faithful life. And in doing so, that relationship is mended with God. And we're able to walk with him, not perfect, because we'll never be perfect, but through Jesus Christ, through the death, burial, and resurrection, then we are seen as pure and clean before God. And that relationship, as Adam and Eve once had it, is what it looks like for us all over again. If you have any needs, you have any struggles, we invite you to come forward as we stand to sing the song of invitation. Just as I can.